Hello, everyone, and welcome to this fireside chat with Matthew Prince, the co-founder and CEO of Cloudflare. My name is Joyce Hagme. I'm a senior researcher at Chatham House, a London-based think tank, and I'm the co-editor of the Journal of Cyber Policy. The unprecedented digital adoption that we have been witnessing since the start of the pandemic has shown how important and indispensable digital technologies are. And for the millions of people who have transitioned at speed into a more virtual way of living, the benefits as well as the risks abound. In this chat, we will be focusing on the exponential use of the internet during the pandemic and what the implications of this increased use are, in particular from a resilience point of view. It has become clearer that this rapid and unplanned for uh, digital adoption has brought new opportunities for cyber attacks, whether against critical national infrastructure, including healthcare institutions, to small and medium enterprises, and attacks against the individual internet users. We will look at some of the big cybersecurity trends and lessons that we've learned from uh, this past year, asking about what needs to happen to increase the resilience against these attacks, what kind of mindset, policies and tools are needed. Um, so I'll be taking questions towards the end of this session. So please do use the chat function to add those there and I'll try and ask Matthew as many as I can. Uh, hi, Matthew, and it's great to have you with us uh, today. Thank you so much uh, for having me. Brilliant. So as uh, the CEO of a company that works in over 100 countries, uh, which mission is to help uh, build a better internet, what are some of the big trends that you have seen in relation to the internet since the start of the pandemic? How and how did they impact your work and how did you cope? Yeah, you know, this last year has been uh, a, a remarkably challenging uh, time for the internet, a challenging time for Cloudflare, uh, but also I think a time that has helped us uh, recognize how important the internet is for keeping keeping people connected and, and keeping them online. Uh, this time last year, our team was working around the clock, scrambling in order to make sure that our systems could continue to cope with what was just unprecedented demand uh, mm -hmm. for internet access. Uh, over the course of about three weeks, uh, on a global basis, we saw in many places as much as uh, as doubling of internet demand and a real shift in when that demand was was being requested. And so uh, the you know the 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 late Senator Ted Stevens uh, got a lot of flack for saying that the internet is is a series of tubes. Um, but as one of the companies that uh, that helps make sure the internet continues to flow, at some level, that analogy is is a pretty good analogy. Uh, the internet is, at some level, just a series of tubes, and those tubes have a finite capacity. And uh, when when we saw a doubling of internet usage in such a short amount of time, uh, the the internet got to some breaking points. Uh, and it was only because of the work of a number of of companies working together to make sure that in those choke points, in those limited regions, uh, the internet could continue. To, to flow. Um, I, you know, I, I think we are still in the middle of a pandemic. Uh, there's still a lot of people who are, are suffering, a lot of people who are dying around the world, and we need to be uh, very cognizant of that. And obviously, the superheroes of this period of time have been, you know, the frontline medical responders and the scientists who have, you know, taken care of the sick and, and miraculously uh, found vaccines uh, that, that seem very effective uh, for for this disease as quickly as possible, but you know I think our entire team is proud uh, of the fact that that we have been sort of the faithful sidekick along with that. And for those people who could continue to connect uh, with with their their work, with their loved ones and others in a virtual way, uh, the fact that the internet has continued to work has has been one of the things that that has has really I think held held a, a bunch of society together. And and I imagine just how much worse this could have been uh, had it happened just even 10 years ago when we didn't have technologies like this to be able to connect to connect people reliably together. Uh, and, I, and I think that illustrates how important uh, the Internet is and, and hopefully uh, will be a, a lesson that we remember for some time to come. 
Uh, thanks, uh, Matthew. You talked about how the internet got to a breaking point and how you know a bunch of companies had to work together to keep it going. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? What were the main essential elements to keep this uh, the internet going and to not break after all this pressure that you talked about? Sure. So you know, I think that the place where we you know we saw we saw local challenges around the world. So at some level. Uh, just some background on Cloudflare. So at Cloudflare, we run a global network that spans more than 200 cities uh, worldwide in more than 100 countries. And we make sure the internet continues to flow, um, both making sure that the performance is good under normal circumstances, and that if there is some sort of cyber attack or cyber event, that we're able to stop that um, as well. And so I think that there have been a number of different stages of, of challenges for the internet over the course of the last 15 months. Um, the first was simply a, a usage and utilization uh, stage. Um, and in, in various places around the world where internet infrastructure may not be as built out, especially the underlying backbones that connect the internet together, uh, there were definitely points in time where those metaphorical pipes uh, got almost to their, their bursting point. You can't imagine many public utilities that if all of a sudden they had twice as much, much usage overnight, would continue to function. The sewer system having twice as much usage, the electrical grid, uh, the, the freeway system, you know, they would all come grinding to a halt. And the internet largely continued to work, although there were places around the world where we really saw strain. Europe uh, was one of those places where a lot of the infrastructure there got right to the edge of its, its breaking point. And that required companies like Cloudflare, but also other companies that were, were providing what were some non-essential Usage of, usage of the internet, so companies like Netflix or Disney, uh, which voluntarily decreased their bit rates for streaming in order to make sure there were just literally less bits flowing through through the, the proverbial pipes uh, to make sure that that happened. And I think what was really rewarding about that uh, was to watch as companies that um, were all involved in making sure the internet worked uh, collaborated together in order to do the right thing to make sure that those essential bits that needed to flow uh, were were available, while still making sure that people could be entertained and and could communicate with their families and friends and 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 other things. And I think that that was that was sort of the first stage of the challenges. I think the second stage, um, which happened sort of starting in midsummer of last year, was that there was then a dramatic uptick in the number of cyber attacks. Uh, that were that were launched. At first, uh, they had the characteristics of you know what we call board kid attacks. Um, cyber attacks uh, tick up every year as as school lets out uh, and kids who are sort of smart and don't have anything better to do uh, go home and and, uh, and and literally you know launch cyber attacks to to entertain themselves. Um, but unfortunately, it shifted uh, fairly quickly to then targeting um, what were uh, much more sophisticated attacks both criminals uh, taking advantage of the fact that more people were working at home and therefore didn't have the same kind of protections that their, their company might, might afford to them. And then uh, secondly, uh, in, in, uh, unfortunately, in some cases, what appear to be nation state actors uh, targeting oftentimes healthcare infrastructure in order to embarrass some parts of the world, uh, presumably, uh, and, and, and slow the rollout of critical care. Um, we saw that. Um, we were super concerned about that. We provided our services at no cost to anyone who is experiencing uh, those types of attacks. And one of the things that we did was actually provide um, our our services to small businesses, uh, nonprofits, other organizations uh, that had people working from home in order to make sure that uh, that they could continue to to operate. And, and we did that at no cost because we knew that it was it was an important thing uh, for us to do. I think the last stage has been really um, in the, the beginning of 2021 as, uh, as as countries are really rolling out the infrastructure to deliver vaccines uh, for their populace. Um, again, we've seen that this is this requires the internet to be able to coordinate. It's something that um, that we're, we're that we're keenly aware of. We we step forward and volunteered our services to provide um, the infrastructure for any vaccine uh, distribution related services through what we call Project Fair Shot uh, and no cost. I think other companies like Akamai and Google and Microsoft have also stepped up to do something similar. And and I think that that's been an important part of making sure that the uh, vaccine rollout. 
uh, has gone as well as it has in the places around the world where it's been able to to go well. But you know, we continue to watch um, with a, a, a significant amount of concern uh, regions like India uh, that are that are obviously still very much suffering. And we when we I think it's important that we recognize that we are still in the middle of a pandemic, and it's important for companies like ours, government institutions, um, individuals, organizations to all be working together in order to deliver the services that we can in order to help hopefully get through this as as a as a as a as a society globally uh, as quickly as we can. Uh, thank you, uh, Matthew. So uh, but just to, you talked about the uptick in, in cyber attacks, and we have been seeing an increasing number uh, of ransomware attacks specifically against critical national infrastructure, including obviously the latest one against the US colonial pipe. What do you think are some of the elements that are enabling this increase and what is really needed to disrupt this trend? Yeah, I think, you know, I think there's um I think there's sort of a, a good news story and a bad news story uh, here. So starting with the bad news story, um, the bad news is that uh, unfortunately there there remains a lot of um, legacy aging infrastructure uh, that relies on out of date technologies uh, that that are relatively easy uh, to to compromise. And we've we've seen that with a number of of stories here. These are not um, you know incredibly sophisticated uh, attacks. Um, they, they are largely exploiting either somebody um, inadvertently clicking on a link in an email or having used a not particularly secure uh, password. Um, and, and unfortunately, um, once an attacker is able to get into some part of, of the infrastructure, uh, that, that they are then able to spread out and cause you know, significant harm uh, to to uh, to to organizations, and and we've seen that uh, now in a number of very high profile uh, incidents. That's not changed. That's been the case uh, for a while. And so the question is, what is it that has has changed? And you know, I, I think the potentially good news uh, around around this is that um, I think that that the hackers are uh, under the impression, and I think it's a correct a correct impression that the world is starting to take these sorts of attacks significantly more seriously than uh, than than we have in the past. And and the hackers sort of understand that if all of a sudden you see crackdowns on this activity around the world, then then their days of being able to use the the exploits that they have are are somewhat numbered. And in that sense, um, I, I think that you are seeing a lot that is getting thrown at sort of the proverbial wall right now, uh, looking for any sorts of, of vulnerabilities, because I think that there is a sense in the hacking community that, uh, that, that, that the window for, for this is, is, is closing over time. And the good news is that as we have seen in the past, uh, actions on a, on a uh, intergovernment level, uh, taking actions to control this, it has resulted in decreases in, in cyber attacks and, and hacking. Uh, and so I think that as you see governments around the world start to focus on these issues, I'm actually optimistic that we might be seeing the worst of, of these attacks and that, and that there might be a, 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 a sort of optimism out, uh, outcome on the other side. That said, we won't get through this until we modernize the way that our critical infrastructure is deployed. And the best metaphor uh, that I have for this is that you know once upon a time if you were building boats the way you kept a boat from sinking was you built the hole extremely strong uh, and thick and made sure that you know it, it was it was impenetrable um, and and that's sort of like people who say you know we need to write perfect software I think the challenge is there can always be one bad weld or one weak rivet that if it's burst in an old school boat. Uh, once water starts getting in, you can sink the entire boat. And so what I think the new approach to security and what you know we use ourselves and what our services that we provide to to our customers and to our partners uh, through through projects like Project Galileo are what we think of as almost the equivalent of bulkheads in a boat, because there is always going to be some vulnerability. There will always be some person who accidentally kick, clicks on a link. But when that happens, what you have to make sure is that the damage that can be done from that is contained. So like in a boat, if there's one bad rivet, the, 
that springs a leak. If you have bulkheads, that doesn't fill the entire boat with water. That just fills one one particular bulkhead, and it is much less of a of a concern. And so I think that move to a new uh, way of approaching security, which is has been known in the industry as a zero trust approach to security, I think that's the equivalent of building bulkheads in the boat. And I think the good news is that we're seeing more and more companies adopt those sorts of solutions, and that that can really help us have a much more secure uh, critical infrastructure going forward. So some of the uh, uh, you know experts when they comment on ransomware attacks and the increase also mentioned the uh, the business model and how it's actually profitable for uh, for criminals that you know organizations who are being uh, subject to ransomware at, uh, attacks are sometimes paying the ransom against the advice of law enforcement. So if you don't break that cycle, you're not really able to break the the, the ransomware uh, uh, you know trend. What are your views on this? You know, I think that, um, I mean, our advice would always be to not pay uh, people who are who are sending you ransomware. But that's easy to say, you know, today it's hard when you, you know, it, it, you, you need to get your systems online in order to process and, and deliver fuel across the you know eastern seaboard of the United States. You have to get your systems online in order to deliver um, you know, critical parts of of the the food and and uh, and um, agricultural supply chain, and so you know, I think that um, I, I I have I have sympathy for the the teams at these at these companies that come under these attacks, uh, and their 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 need to get their systems back online, and so I think that um, that that it's it is it is important that we break that cycle um but i think it's going to be you know e even before uh ransomware you had lots of ways that that criminals were able to you know extort uh other other companies and this is sort of the modern equivalent of of you know the the guy walking into the store and saying you know you got a great store here shame it shame if it, it if it burned down um i can make sure that doesn't happen if you you know leave a bag of cash on 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 the on the counter so this is a business model that is it extends way beyond and and is is way older than uh than 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 computers or in the internet or, or or ransomware and so i i think it would be great if we can uh find ways to disrupt uh that business model but foundationally um, what we should also be doing is working to make sure that that businesses are more secure, uh, organizations are more secure, and that we have those tools in a way that is easy to use, affordable, accessible to anyone who's online. And, and that's that's really what our mission is at Cloudflare. You talk about uh, how a lot of the, um, you know, when you were referring to the bad news, you said, the legacy infrastructure is actually making all of these or a lot of these attacks happen in the first place. And I'm, I'm interested in your views as to the tools and tactics that are being used by the perpetrators, because what you said suggests that actually they're not very sophisticated. They just use legacy or like are make, you know benefiting from the legacy or someone, the lack of cyber hygiene perhaps within uh, uh, employees that they are able to do their attacks. Are you, how would you describe the sophistication of uh, the, the level of the perpetrators who are inflicting a lot of harm. Would you say that they are increasing in sophistications using more emerging technologies? Should we be worried about how, where, you know, where this might go? So I think, um, so it depends that, the, so, so it depends on, on what the target is. Uh, if, you know, a lot of people who are in the audience um, for, for RightsCon um, have, have, real reason to worry about very sophisticated uh, targeted nation state attacks. Um, and, and in those cases, the goal of the attack is to um, be extremely precise, uh, to um, ideally leave no notice that, uh, that, that an attack has taken place, and then um, be able to usually for nation state level espionage reasons, be able to um, observe uh, or, or, or thwart or control uh, how somebody is using uh, technology online. And so there are very sophisticated actors out there using what are uh, sophisticated exploits to go after individuals. Um, but but that is that is and, and, and we should worry about that that issue. But I think that that is a different issue 
than something like the colonial pipeline attack. In the case of the colonial pipeline attack, the goal is to find an organization uh, that you can get into and then actually create as much chaos uh, as you can across that organization, making it impossible for that organization uh, to, do, uh, to do their job. And so while it may be possible to use sophisticated, very uh, targeted uh, uh, attacks, um, the, the, that tends not to align with the business models of, of, the, of those attackers. Um, because once those attacks are known, once they've, once they've been uh, disclosed, they get closed down um, relatively quickly. And uh, and so and so it, it it often is 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 something where you know in one case with sophistication you want to be subtle and clandestine in in the case of these ransomware attacks it's it's quite the opposite and so in most of the cases that we're seeing the um, the fundamental problem is is a relatively uh, is is a relatively um, uh, simplistic type of attack in most of these ransomware um, uh, cases and good cyber hygiene is the right thing in order to protect that. I think there is a different set of challenges around protecting individuals that might be targeted by sophisticated nation state level attacks, um, but, but, but we, we shouldn't necessarily uh, you know, combine those th two things into one, into one category. I think you have to sort of understand what your attack surface is uh, and what your risk profile is. And hopefully those people who, again, are in the audience that are uh, that are that are thinking about um, that they might be targets are, are already practicing a lot of the of of the good hygiene around password security, two-factor authentication, making sure that um, that your devices are up to date, uh, and, and practicing other good protections. Uh, because because again, I think you do have a, a a different level of security and different level of threats. But for the most part, the sort of ransomware attacks that we see in the news. Are you know start with and and are really uh, facilitated by relatively simple uh, attacks that that don't require um, you know a, a level of sophistication that, that we see in in other parts of the space. Uh, if we look at uh, just a kind of like moving to the what what sort of response um, is available and what countries are doing to deal with those uh, with those challenges. So if we look at countries uh, around the world, we see for example around. Uh, you know, over 140, uh, maybe 148 now countries have adopted cybersecurity strategies. Uh, some of them for the very first time. We see an increased amount of uh, public-private initiatives uh, on cybersecurity, and generally more talks and policy circles about the importance of cybersecurity. Uh, so, as someone who works around the world, would you say that we have reached the needed level of awareness at the government level to be able to deal with these challenges, or do you think this is still confined? to a small uh, a number of countries? Well, again, I think it goes back to what might be the good news uh, of out of what feels like a really bad uh, series of events over, over the last several months. And that is that I think that um, there is a growing awareness around governments that this is a extremely destructive uh, and disruptive uh, type of attack, which, which, can, which can risk Critical infrastructure and, and risk the health and well-being of of citizens, and so and, and I think in part because uh, a number of the cyber attackers are concerned about government efforts to crack down on this, that that we are that that actually is driving more of them to try to cause as much harm in in the short term as possible. We have seen even you know just in the last uh, several months. A dramatic uptick in in both the um, ransomware uh, cyber locker attacks, but also DDoS uh, ransoms um, as well, and it feels almost like a a, a level of of just almost um, uh, sort of sort of almost spastic energy before uh, before sort of a coming a coming crackdown. On, uh, on on what what's there. So I do think that governments are increasingly recognizing this as as a concern. I do think that they are are um, are are starting to think about how to crack down on it. One of the things, though, that I think is is incredibly important uh, and 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 critical for this audience to be thinking about is that there's a there will be a temptation uh, as governments around the world start to think about how to control cybersecurity. Uh, for them to lump in other things, uh, such as 
uh, journalism that they don't like or, you know, dissident behavior uh, there and try to lump thing. What we've seen time and time and time again is that sort of the cyber attacker who who shuts down, uh, you know, a pipeline by by uh, infecting a computer gets lumped into the same category as a group that is protesting in the streets um, over over government corruption. And I think that it's important for this community to be watching very carefully as governments take action and very warily, because again, we, we have to make sure that um, the internet continues to live up to its ideals. And as we uh, as we enact, as there is government action to try to control uh, what what uh, how cyber attacks uh, work online and 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 keep them in in place, that that doesn't slip into uh, other censorship or other um, ways that that governments might want to control how how the internet works and how speech is uh, is delivered online. So you're talking about undesirable content and what some governments are doing. And we have a question from the audience here saying that Cloudflare took a bold step in 2019 in removing a chan. Can you talk about how and why you reached that decision and whether it's still realistic for infrastructure providers to say that they have no responsibility for content related issues? Yeah, I don't think that um, I don't think that we or anyone else would say that we don't have any responsibility. I think the question is just where that responsibility um, lies. So today, uh, about one in six uh, websites online um, relies on relies on Cloudflare, um, but we are we are the network provider that sits behind them. Um, you know, if you think about the responsibility for content, which is which is published online, you know, the ultimate responsibility is with the individual who publishes that content. Uh, then maybe on but below that might be the platform, whether that's Facebook or Twitter or Shopify or any of any of the other other platforms that are out there uh, that sit sit there. Below that is the actual hosting provider uh, that is 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 below it. And then below that would be someone like us, like the network provider. And then there's infrastructure that sits even below that, like the DNS provider or the registrar. And what I think is is important is that as we think about what the different roles are, um, the answer is not that you don't have any responsibility, but you want to be very careful. So, for instance, um, if we terminate some piece of content, uh, which is which is flowing through our network, but it's also flowing through a particular hosting provider or a particular platform that sits on top of it, we're effectively taking away the agency of those organizations that sit on top of us in order to make decisions that are aligned with whatever their own abuse policies are, their own principles are. And so I think the further that you go down in the stack, the more careful uh, and more deliberate that you have to be in making those, those decisions. In the case of HAN, you know, I think that it was one of the rare times where we had individuals that were acting in a way that was, that was um, completely outside of the values of society. We had a platform uh, that was specifically designed to be lawless, um, not responsible to either the, the laws or norms of, of any, any societies around the world and actively trying to thwart the efforts of law enforcement as they, as they invested crimes that were um, in part uh, uh, um, uh, at least announced on, on the platform. You had a hosting provider uh, that was actually, again, it specifically set up to be outside of the reach of any of society's norms or laws. And then you had us that were sitting below it. And so I think in the ideal case, you would have individuals taking responsibility for the content that they create. Uh, if that doesn't happen, then you, would, then you would have the underlying platforms take that responsibility. If that doesn't happen, then the host should take that responsibility. And in the rare cases where none of those four organizations uh, are willing to take responsibility, then sometimes that's going to fall to Cloudflare in order to take that responsibility uh, and, and do that. We want to make that something that is, is rare. Uh, we want to make that something that um, you know, we, we, we do very deliberately. Um, that, that, of course, then means that there are times when there's content that flows through our network that we're not proud of and that we, that we, don't, that we don't personally like. But we think that it's important to really delineate those different lines in the technology stack and, and make sure that the underlying internet itself, the network itself, is not being used as a way of censoring uh, what content is online because that, that obviously creates enormous challenges and enormous risks uh, for, for a lot of the reasons that, that I was talking about before in terms of governments regulating um, uh, activity on, on the internet.
So just kind of staying on this topic, what do you think are the likely scenarios that we might be faced with when it comes to uh, content regulation and content governance? What do you think, you know, where, which way are we heading? Well, you know, the, the Internet is this massively disruptive force, and I think it's hard to overstate how disruptive to um, to to traditional and historic institutions um, it it has been and um, you know for for quite some time there were sort of two models of of internet regulation one was sort of the u.s model which i think it's hard again to overstate how i mean radical the u.s approach to uh freedom of expression it is and it is it is not one that is shared by by most of the world, and yet because the internet started there, um, that radical approach uh, is what has has taken hold um, around around most of the world um, uh, up until up until uh, you know now. Um, the other approach was really the Chinese approach, and um, at some level, the Chinese approach is is hard to understand uh, for for me as someone who grew up. Uh, you know, in, in the United States, but but I think it's actually it's actually as as as, as I've thought about it more, it 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 is um, it, it's something that that maps to what uh, what other uh, um, other types of content that are regulated do around the world. So, for instance, if you want to start a, a radio station, basically anywhere in the world, uh, you have to apply to whoever the regulator is in the, in the United States. That's the FCC for a license to be able to broadcast across a certain uh, spectrum. Um, there are rules uh, that allow you, you have to broadcast at a certain, um, at a certain uh, strength of your frequency. And in the United States, there are certain words that you're not allowed to say, um, you know, somewhat absurdly uh, on, on, the, on the radio station. Otherwise, the FCC will, will pull your license. Uh, and, and we sort of all accept that that's the case because, um, you know, if you didn't have some sort of coordinating body then there would be chaos, um, uh, presumably, because because you'd have people broadcasting on the same frequency and, and radio just wouldn't work. Um, that's sort of the way that China thinks about, about the Internet, is that if you want to put something up online that is going to be broadcast from inside of China, you have to have a license to do that. And that license is called an ICP license, and there's a process to uh, to applying for it. But it's, it's very similar uh, to if you were applying for a radio uh, license in, in the United States with the FCC. Um, that of course, you know, creates uh, you know a much more of a control uh, uh, plane for the Chinese authorities to be able to control what content is online. And just like uh, the FCC controls what content is on the radio, um, that the, the Chinese government does that uh, online as as well. What I think that the world in general, outside of the U.S. and China. I think the the challenge right now is that the world is not totally happy with either of those models um, for regulating how the internet works. Um, they uh, the world is worried about uh, the model of anything goes, which has kind of been the U.S. model in the past, and the world isn't quite ready to go to the Chinese model of we have to approve everything uh, in advance. Uh, and so the world, I think, right now is looking for what that new model is. And you have some various uh, centers around the world that are thinking about these issues um, really well. I think Europe is actually doing a very good job of thinking about how uh, and when and, and in what ways uh, the, the Internet, uh, it should be controlled and, and regulated. And, and, I, and I think that um, they have been thoughtful at understanding what the different layers of the Internet stack are and why as you regulate something like Facebook, it may not make sense to regulate, you know, the undersea cable operator and, and actually been, you know, very, very, very thoughtful about how how to uh, move forward around that. And, and, and I think that's the case. I think um, the challenge, though, is is whether or not that coalesces into something that can be a uh, a model that the rest of the world can follow. I think the country that I'm watching the most closely um, and, and where where I think um, you know the the likely kind of new model for internet regulation uh, for better or worse is likely to come out of is going to be India. Um, India, you know is is um, is I think thinking through if they have they have the critical mass and size to to really be kind of a new anchor for a third way of internet regulation. Um, I think the challenge is that um, that you know what we're seeing out of it uh, out of India so far 
looks like it is going to err more uh, towards sort of a Chinese model. And, and I think that's, um, that's something that we all really need to pay, pay a lot of attention to and think about um, whether, whether that's something that, that we want the entire internet to, uh, to follow. And so I think watch India extremely carefully. And I think that's, that's where a lot of, of sort of the future of internet regulation is, is, going, to be, is going to be thought through. Thank you for that. Uh, and we have another question here from the audience asking you that if you could raise one or two misperceptions about the internet and the cloud, what would they be? You know, um, I used to teach um, a course uh, on um, uh, internet technology and privacy law um, back 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 when I back when I was a back when I was a, 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 a not very good law professor. And one of the things, um, you know, the students would come in and they were they were um, you know they 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 were they're like they were. They were very idealistic, um, you know. They sort of had a lot of the same same um, background as, as I do, and and you know there there are just a lot of assumptions on, you know, th that the internet is this this almost infinite resource, and um, and and that that's uh, and that that's and that that it that the way it, it it has been will just continue to grow, and and that 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 will be the case over time. And I remember one of the things I learned teaching law. Was that the same thing that 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 kids enjoyed when they were in second or third grade? Uh, is is the same thing that that um, that law students enjoy uh, later on in their careers, which is that their favorite day of class was field trips, and so we would always take I would always take them on a field trip to 350 Cermak, which is um, which is the largest data center in the world. Um, I was teaching in Chicago and. And so we would go down there. It's it's near McCormick Place, off off Lakeshore Drive. For those of you who know you know the city, it's the old Yellow Pages um, uh, printing warehouse. Uh, for anyone who remembers what the Yellow Pages uh, were, and um, and it's turned into this giant facility. And the the impression as you walk through that door and you walk through all the security, and and then you know the the different layers and and into the actual facility is like, wow, this is. There's a lot of there's a lot of atoms uh, that are that are involved and a lot of electrons uh, that that need to flow in order for all these bits um, to flow. And so I think the first thing um, I, I would say is that um, you know there there is the the, the internet is um, more more costly and as a result more fragile uh, to administer than than I think the average person knows. It, it feels just magical. Um, but behind the scenes, there there are a lot of people working incredibly hard to make sure uh, that it stays online. And and the reason why that then means that it's fragile is you know that that building 350 Cermak, if it were if it if it were to go offline uh, for some reason, would disrupt a huge portion of how how the internet works. Um, if if a government wanted to control uh, how bits flew fly fl uh, across the internet and and what bits are there. You know, there are still a relatively uh, small set of, of organizations and, and places around the world that they that they potentially can can do that. And so I think it it is up to all of us to really think about, um, you know, what is the Internet to recognize the fragility of it uh, and, and to really have agency as we think about its future and we think about what how it's going to be regulated and and, and how it's going to be. Uh, uh, connected to and how it's going to be controlled or or, or uncontrolled, and um, and that 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 is is a an incredibly difficult set of challenges uh, that you know I, I think are are some of the most important questions that that we can ask, and it's and it's what our entire team and it's what Cloudflare is set up uh, to to um, be a part of of hope, hopefully helping solve. You know, when we say our mission is to help build a better internet. Um, that means how do we how do we make sure that anyone anywhere in the world who needs to get access to the network and and all the advantages that that brings, whether they are publishing content or consuming content, that they can do so in a way that is is um, on the same footing and on the same level as as you know some of the internet giants or or some people from wealthy countries or organizations around the world. And and I think that that if we can do that. That really is the internet living up to to its its best self. So speaking about like access to your products, the question to you is: Do you think repressive governments should have access to Cloudflare products? 
Yeah, I mean, it's a, it, an issue we really struggle with. Um, you know, we are computer scientists more than political scientists, and so we really lean on the um, the 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 people who are in this audience and 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 then other experts uh, in order to in order to um, in order to help us suggest uh, what to do. I think generally uh, our our approach has been that we're 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 not. We're not selling the sort of guns and ammo. We're selling the 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 um, the, the metaphorical um, bulletproof jacket, and and we do think that providing access to information um, is 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 something which is 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 important for us to do, regardless of of whether we agree with that information or disagree with that information uh, that's online. I think it as we start to make what are editorial decisions on who can and cannot use our network. I think it starts us down a path, which is a really pretty tricky path for us us to head down. Um, you know, we terminated some really vile neo Nazis uh, from from our our network, uh, and and within the next seven days, we received over three thousand requests uh, from nation states saying, "Oh, here are a bunch of organizations that are using uh, your platform that we don't agree with. Either please kick them off as well." Um, and and some of those were, um, I mean, meant most of those actually were were very um, uh, positive. It, it, it would be things that, that we would we would agree with, and and were people who are doing hard work, um, oftentimes reporting on uh, corruption and um, and and other things in in the in the countries where they they operate. So I, I think it's it's a tough issue, and I think we follow the guidance from uh, the the State Department in the United States, which is where we which is where we operate. And others in order to make sure that we comply with any sanctions uh, or, or regulations. But we are very hesitant to make a unilateral call on, you know, this is this is a government that is 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 doing something that um, that you know we we don't agree with or we don't approve of because we worry about the precedent that that sets. And uh, and 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 again, I think it's very dangerous for someone who who operates as low down on the internet as we do to be making a lot of determinations on what content is and is not online. Right. Um, I have a question for you around sort of the digital divide, and uh, you know, if you look at this, um, you know, we talked about the sharp take up of digital technology um, during the pandemic, but it has also exposed this widening digital divide, not only between the businesses themselves, but also between countries. And we've, you know, uh, figures from the UN say that almost half of the world's population is still uh, offline, and for those, of course, uh, the experience has been different throughout the pandemic. What, in your opinion, are some of the actions that are needed to help close this divide so uh, we i mean there there are there are a number of there are a number of things uh that that of course we we have to do and and i think that we need to make it so that the the internet is uh, affordable and accessible to everyone on earth um that that wants to be that wants to be connected to it um i i think i try to to sort of stay in my lane and and talk about those things that that we can impact but one of the things that we're really thinking about and and working on is how in underserved communities, um, often often rural communities, and, and those those are you know in in developing countries, but they also can be in developed countries uh, in in parts of the world that you know just the the local telecoms haven't prioritized uh, making access to broadband services. But how can we use Cloudflare's um, reach and our network? In order to help facilitate access to uh, the internet as 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 broadly as as possible, and make sure that regardless of where you are on 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 the planet, you have access to a fast uh, connection. Now we can't do that ourselves. Um, we don't make uh, you know uh, mobile phones. We we are unlikely to bid on on radio spectrum, um, but we do want to make sure that if if you are a local entrepreneur. Or a local telecommunications um, provider that is providing services in rural parts of the world. How can we then help facilitate you providing the best possible experience uh, to all of your customers and do it in a way which again doesn't disadvantage you uh, because you are you are living in a, a developing portion of the world or or in um, you know a rural part of of a developed country, and and I think that that's um, that's something that. You know we can help with, and I think that's something that we are thinking about and working on. 
Um, and and that's a, a that I think um, is one of the ways that you know companies can think about how they can provide services uh, to to connect uh, more of the world uh, online. In our case, you know we're in you know well, well over 200 countries now. Uh, uh, excuse me, well over 100 countries, well over 200 cities uh, now around the world. Um, you know, the majority of the customers that pay us are are in you know concentrated in in the developed world. But but we really do believe that our mission is to to make the internet accessible everywhere on Earth, and so that's why you know we continue to build out our infrastructure um, all around the world. And if we can then use that infrastructure to help support those less connected communities, um, I think that that would be something that 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 I would be really proud of, and and that would it would help uh, you know be one small piece of helping bridge bridge the digital divide. But there's there's a there's a lot that that we have to do and I think it's important for every company that's touching touching the internet to think about how it is that they can provide that and do it in a way that that gives people not not sort of a dumbed down version of the internet but a full and complete version of the internet. Thank you. I'd like to go back a little bit to talking about the sort of public-private uh, partnership that is needed and the collaboration. Um, and going back to the all sort of like the increased uh, uh, threats that we are witnessing, what do you think are the lessons that have been learned from recent large-scale uh, cyber attacks in terms of effective collaboration between uh, governments and the private sector? And what do you think the role of the pri private sector should be? I mean, how is it evol evolving? How, how would you like to see it going? You know, so 12 years ago, Cloudflare was just an idea on a piece of paper. And, um, and, and you know, it took a lot of hard work from, from you know, all of the team that has built, built the company into what it is today. Um, but we couldn't have done it without, you know, a stable and functioning government uh, that, that allowed us to make, make the investments that we needed uh, and and build the inf and build our infrastructure out and support it and do it in a way that that um, that that was that was important and that that's not unique to Cloudflare that's that's true of any business anywhere in the world where you you have to work with you know the greater community and society that you're a part of and um, y you know the the stakeholders that you serve are much broader than you know, just your investors or or your employees. It's it, you know it is a a broader set of stakeholders. And so I think something that has been in our DNA from the beginning has been always to ask how can we work with that broader set of stakeholders in order to provide uh, services. And so um, you know we're, we're uh, we we launched Project Galileo, which is the uh, the 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 um, project that gives our services at no cost to any politically or artistically important organizations uh, around the world. We've worked with a lot of the civil society organizations uh, in order to help us uh, overcome, you know, again, our, our lack of, of, of real understanding of what are uh, the organizations that are the most deserving of that and, and worked, worked to, to do that, you know, incredibly well. And I think that that's been a great partnership with, with civil society. I think the, the example of for us, a partnership with government that is that that worked really well was um, what we call the Athenian project. Um, in 2016, I think we watched um, with with you know really grave concern uh, as what what I had thought of as a you know very stable institution, which were elections uh, in the United States, were um, at least called into question by uh, cyber attack activities uh, uh, around around the world. And it, and, it, and it felt, you know, like like the uh, entire way that elections were organized in the United States, where uh, you you pushed, you made it a massively distributed effort where every county ran their own election in their own in own particular way. While that was a really great uh, a way of, of organizing elections for sort of the public choice uh, and, um, and and other challenges of of the you know first 200 years of, of the country's uh, history, um, you know recently that that put all of those officials um, very much at risk for sophisticated nation state tampering uh, as, as they went forward. And so, you know, we resolved that we had to do something uh, about that. And so we launched the Athenian project with a, a simple premise, which was how can we provide our services at no cost. To any U.S. election official that is charged with 
administering elections in any way. And, and we can't protect everything. You know, we, we're not in the voting booth. And if there's corrupt software on on a voting machine, um, that's not something that that we're in a position to be able to uh, to protect. But we can help make sure that you know people can register to vote uh, through you know a website reliably uh, and consistently. They can find out where their polling place is. Um, the the districts can report back the results uh, through a secure mechanism. They can then uh, the the Associated Press or whoever can actually publish those results out. And so the internet is is critically. Um, intertwined today with safe and, and fair elections. And when we launched that um, you know, shortly after the 2016 election, um, I, I don't think we knew exactly uh, what the what the uptake would be. And, you know, again, I, I think that, you know, we, we there there are people in there are people on, on our team who are Democrats, there are people on our team who are Republicans. And and we we worked incredibly hard to say, you know, we don't care if you're a red state or a blue state or a purple state. We just want to make sure that you've got the tools and technology to uh, to keep to keep the institutions uh, that that are critical to government online and and secure. And I, I'm really proud of the fact that you know while there were there were there were a lot of things about the 2020 election that were um, that were that were very uh, uh, contentious um, across across the country. Um, cyber attacks did not play a significant role in them. And 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 I think that that was because of hard work from Cloudflare, but also organizations like Microsoft and Google, who are providing their services at no cost um, to governments around the world. And uh, and that was a real change from the 2016 uh, elections. And and I think it's I think that that was incredibly rewarding uh, for for our entire team. The thing that's 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 interesting about it is you know if if you if you're you know I, I think a lot of the people who are in this audience. Um, would would see that as you know of course businesses should be doing that um but but businesses sometimes you know the business leaders sometimes have a hard time justifying it because they have to you know it's 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 time that their engineers are spent building building features that could otherwise be spent um you know for features for you know big customers who pay you you know lots of money or or time that um you know the distraction to the to rest of what you're doing um but I, I think for anyone who is um you know, a, a business leader, I will say that like there has been nothing which has been better at helping us recruit some of the best engineers in the world at helping us um, recruit customers uh, to sign up for our service than um, doing what is right on on a societal basis and spending the time to to work on these, you know, public private partnerships, uh, partnerships with civil society. And and, you know, we do those things because we think they're the right thing to do. Um, but it, it also turns out that those those are the the right thing to do to attract the best engineers in the world, um, you know, sign up more customers, uh, and, and and so you can you can do you can do the right thing, uh, and also have a have a it be the right thing for your business as well. And I think we we learn that lesson over and over again, and uh, and it's part of why it's it's easy for us to continue to invest in these in these areas. Um. So I have a few questions uh, from the audience. Uh, one is saying that last year you joined uh, GNI and committed to working towards the UN principles on business and human rights. Can you speak to how this has impacted the company internally and what are you doing differently now after you've uh, signed up to this uh, to, to, to this to this uh, work? So, you know, one of the things that's, um, you know, I, I think that we have done I think we are making significant progress in fixing what I think of as the kind of core bugs of the internet. And some of those bugs are that someone who is sitting on a line uh, between you and whoever you're communicating with uh, can, the way the internet was designed, see everything you're, you're doing, see everything you're saying, see everything you're communicating. And so starting back in 2014, when we made encryption free for you know all of our customers, and that really was um, that, and then the work from Let's Encrypt and Mozilla and EFF, you know that 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 those things really turned the tide from something where encryption was only available to those people who could afford to pay for it, to it was available by default across platforms was a big deal. Um, we've worked with 1.1.1.1, um, our our DNS resolver, to encrypt DNS traffic 
and um, you know push much more of of DNS to be to be encrypted today. Uh, we're working on encrypting the SNI, which is sort of the um, the information on the outside of the uh, of the envelope. We're we're working to um, to actually encrypt the underlying uh, connectivity of how routers uh, connect together, and and as a result of that. It is it is it is creating it's making it much harder for governments to be able to restrict uh, what content flows flows across across the internet um, and and we're sort of closing down all of all of those those um, those different those different paths. Um, that said, there are governments that have laws. Uh, and and those laws uh, in in many times you know are are actually fairly reasonable and and well thought out. I mean it's it's hard to um, you know again as as the American uh, going going into Germany and and you know the Ger a German government says you should shut down uh, neo Nazi content and and you know as a, a naive American you might say well what about the First Amendment and and I think uh, you know if if they don't roll your eyes at you. Um, you know, a, a reasonable um, German regulator will say, well, I understand that that is your law born out of your tradition and your history, but we have very different sets of laws uh, born out of a very different tradition and a very different history. And I think you have to respect that. And, um, and, and, I, and I think that it's important that governments be transparent uh, and, and consistent and accountable to the rules that they have in place, but I think you need to um, that you need to respect that. On the other hand, there are times where um, governments go way too far, and they and they infringe on what are really the civil rights of organizations around the world. And so, the consequence is we um, are able to encrypt more of the traffic online, as we're able to um, shut down a lot of the ways that governments um, traditionally regulate the internet. Um, more and more of those questions come to us, uh, and and we have to um, deal with them. And and again, we operate in all of these countries around the world, and um, and so we have to respect the laws in those countries around the world. But there are times where governments go too far, and you need to set a real floor. And so I think that that's why GNI and the UN are such an important um, uh, uh, principles for companies to sign up to. To be able to push back when governments do go too far and say, you know, this is the floor below which we 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 will not cross. And so I, I keep a, a copy of that um, uh, of of that document um, on my desk, and I think it's a constant reminder for us that um, that we do have obligations and and that we have to make sure that that we're not falling below what what are the basic human rights standards uh, that that are online, even as as we increasingly have to work with governments around the world. Thank you. Um, and I think we have time maybe for one uh, last question. And I wanted, because we've been talking about what governments are doing, how you're working with governments, what private sector companies are doing. But what we haven't talked about is uh, like an entire world that is taking place at the UN level with like two processes, bringing states together, trying to agree on how they should behave with each other in cyberspace. So you had two processes that concluded their work in the last few months, and they managed to agree on what, you know, on the rules of the road, as they call them. Given that some of the biggest attacks have states behind them, what do you think the impact of these agreements will be in, in real life? Well, you know, I know it's it's um, it's fashionable to sort of poo-poo these agreements and say they don't matter. Um, but what's been fascinating now has been watching as there have been, you know, bilateral or multilateral agreements uh, between governments that they actually do then impact uh, how how um, uh, cyber attackers operate. Uh, online, when the Obama administration and and the Xi administration signed a cyber accord, uh, it, it, we actually saw a dramatic decrease in cyber attacks coming out of China, even from uh, from private organizations and individuals targeting uh, U.S. based companies. Um, and so, and 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 then you know the latest example, um, which is which is which is a maybe a less positive one is. That you know, you see a lot of the um, cyber attacks coming out of Russia, um, specifically coding into their their malware uh, restrictions that make sure that they don't touch or target any Russian 
uh, speaking individuals or companies. And so I think it's important that governments work on this. I think it's it's important that um, that these principles get outlined. But again, I would caution this audience to make sure that you continue to watch this because it will be very tempting for governments to slip in additional censorship and and content regulation in the in the form of cyber regulation. And I think it's important that we all watch for that and 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 uh, and try and defend the best of the internet to the best of our abilities. Matthew Prince, uh, thank you very much uh, for your time today and for this great conversation. And thank you very much for the audience and for all the interesting questions and all the luck with the rest of Lightscon. Thank you.